want to welcome everybody to the Pen on Fire speaker series and salon. We usually do this Tuesday nights, but we wanted to uh, have people from back east be able to join us at, at a reasonable hour. And um, the fun thing about this tonight is that I'm not moderating. Corey is moderating. Um, so I'm going to introduce Corey and then he's going to take it away. Um, before I do, though, I want to tell you that the book is everywhere everywhere. You can find the book anywhere and everywhere. Um, I'm going to put the address, phone number, and uh, website of a local bookstore that we like to support, Book Carnival in Orange. And if you want to shop there, they have the book. Otherwise, do what you like and um, just get the book because it's fabulous. And uh, with that, literary maestro Corey Roskin has been programming, producing, participating in and serving on planning committees for literary events for 20 years. Events include the West Hollywood Book Fair, which is how I met Corey years ago when I started sitting on panels there. Um, it was a Sunday, always a Sunday. I loved it, going up to LA. Um, the Lambda Lit Fest, Sci-Fi Fest LA, Pasadena Lit Fest and Literature for Life among others. Uh, Corey also dabbles in writing fiction and personal stories and is currently a member of the Queer Wise Writing Group. Corey, take it away. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thanks for having me. And I'm thrilled to moderate this panel. Uh, it's a terrific anthology. Um, there are 14 stories in there by everybody here tonight, as well as a number of other contributors. Some of them are watching tonight. So thank you for being here. And I know we also, I see, have Johnny Temple, who's here from Akashic Books. And Akashic Books is the publisher of this uh, anthology, as well as, gosh, I think over 100 noir anthologies from all over the world. So Why I'm going to, oh, hello. So I'm going to start with, uh, yes, with Barb, with Barb. Well, not right this second, but I might, how long is she going to be? Maybe we could mute. People need to mute themselves. I think, yeah, yeah, everybody needs if to you're mute. you're not on the panel, maybe you can mute, that'd be great. Um, so I'm going to start with Barbara, who is the editor of the anthology and is also one of the contributors. I'll read her uh, brief bio to you first. Um, Barbara DeMarco Barrett spends time in, in the desert whenever she can. She hosts Writers on Writing on KUCIFM, and her book, Pen on Fire, was a Los Angeles really bestseller. Uh, her short story, Crazy for You, was published in the USA Noir Best of Cash of Noir series after having been published in Orange County Noir. Um, she's also been published in the LA Times, LA Review of Books, Inlandia, Shotgun Honey, Partners in Crime, and Paradigm Shifts. Welcome, Barbara. Hi, Corey. Hi. <laughs> um, so I want to start with you, Barbara. Um, we're, we'll have little passages read from people's books. Um, we're going to do Barbara's a little bit later because I want to start by asking you, Barbara, about the genesis of this anthology and how you got involved with it. I know you initially were involved with um, the Orange County Noir and writing a story for that publication, which then got published in a Best of series. Ah, there we go, right there. Um, so maybe you could talk about your foray into this world and how you ended up editing this anthology. Um, it, it started in 2009 at the LA Times Book Fair, actually. I was in the green room with uh, Susan Strait and T. Jefferson Parker, and Susan said, I was, I was way into essays at the time, writing essays, and um, Susan said, oh, you should contact Gary Phillips because he's, he's uh, moderate, or he's, um, I'm watching people come in the waiting room, so I'm kind of distracted. I can do this thing, though. Okay, you do that. So um, he was um, editor of Orange County Noir, which I didn't know what it was at the time, but Susan said, why don't you contact Gary because he's looking for writers for, for this anthology. And so um, I thought it was an essay anthology. And so I contact Gary and Gary says, yeah, yeah, noir short stories. I have Costa Mesa, you want it? I'm like, uh, sure, I want it. And then I kind of found out what I needed to do. So I spent that summer um, just reading noir, um, just immersing myself in everything noir. And that's how the story came about. Um, and that's when I first learned of Akashic. And at the time, 
I don't know quite how many um, anthologies uh, were out at that time, but you know, for those of you who don't know, um, Akashic has something like 110 anthologies now that take place around the world. And they're all fabulous, all fabulous. And so if you wanna go visit somewhere, you wanna to go to uh, Copenhagen, pick up Copenhagen Noir and learn about this city from a noir point of view, right? But that's how it all began. And then that story was um, included in uh, USA Noir, The Best Of. And um, time went on. I started going out to the desert, leading writers retreats. Kelly has been to, to a few of them. And um, whenever I chose a house or a neighborhood, I would um, go to the Palm Springs police log or the crime log because I wanted to check out crime in the area. And so I just, you know, everything was becoming kind of noir. And um, a few years ago, I just, I just knew there had to be a Palm Springs noir. And um, if anybody did it, I had to be the one. I just had to be the one. And so, because I love Palm Springs and, and I, it just was ripe for stories, for anything dark, because it's so light. It's so bright and light and, and gives you the feeling that nothing could ever go wrong there, but things go wrong there like everywhere. And so that's how it happened. I um, put together a book proposal um, three years ago. Akashic wasn't ready. I went back six months later, they still weren't ready. I went back, I think six months later and they were ready. And so that was two years ago. And that's when it began. And I was out in the desert two years ago, June, uh, starting my story, which ended up taking place at the house I was renting at the time, staring at that swimming pool, wondering, you know, what else could happen with a swimming pool other than pleasure? So, um, does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. Um, before we go to some of the other contributors, I want to ask you, um, in terms of the other contributors to the book, how did how did that happen? How were people selected, and how were the locations where they had their stories? Uh, how did that happen for everybody? Yeah. Um, a few of the writers I knew already wrote noir, like Todd was one. Um, other writers, um, I I was familiar with their fiction and I thought they could do it and would want to do it. And then others came by way of friends, word of mouth. Um, and then the places, I kind of scoped out the whole area and I wanted the whole Coachella Valley covered so, you know, for me, it starts at Joshua Tree, goes down to the Salton Sea, and then Idlewild, Anza to um, Wonder Valley. And so I just, I looked at a map and I went, what about there? That, I like that place and this place and this place. And just, it started filling up. And I, I didn't want the stories concentrated in one area, but all over the place. And then that's how it happened. Um, yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting about this group is that for everybody other than um, Barbara, this is kind of a first foray into noir for the rest of the group. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to move on to, I'm going to go to everybody to read a little piece of your story, introduce everyone, and then we'll talk a little bit about everybody's stories, and then we'll go uh, back to Barbara and talk specifically about the piece that she contributed. So, um, thank you, Barbara. And um, I'm gonna go alphabetically just to make it easy. So uh, we're gonna talk to Chris J. Bonson first, also goes by CJ. Um, CJ is known as a, a zebra by his Chicano uncles and that he is half Mexican and half white. And this walks the strange and sometimes precarious edge between cultures. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the LA Times, uh, the Smithsonian's Air and Space, and various literary journals. He is a jazz critic for Downbeat's uh, magazine's annual critics poll and an assistant editor with Narrative Magazine. Chris divides his time between Southern California and Northwest Ohio, and he's uh, with us today from Ohio. 
So Chris, um, I think we'll have you start by reading a short piece from your selection in the book, which is called Octagon Girl. Uh, the primary setting is Desert Hot Springs. Okay, you're gonna have me uh, draw first blood then here. First blood. Which is fitting for noir. I need to uh, switch to my Clark Kent glasses, if you don't yeah. mind. Perfect. Okay, this is Octagon Girl. <clears throat> Wearing a camo bikini, Bly stepped onto the octagonal platform and began her stride around the cage perimeter. Above her head, she held a white card with the number three on both sides. The upper rows were mostly empty, but there was still a decent crowd of a few thousand. This was her first gig at the new sports arena. Just open in Desert Hot Springs, it was already becoming the venue for MMA fights in the Coachella Valley. God, we needed this place. Many in the crowd looked as if they climbed out of a fissure in the crusty ground. Skin clay colored, eyes deeply crow footed from squinting against the sun glare and the sand pelting in off Banning Pass. Blythe knew them as hardcores of the low desert who would not leave DHS Damn the crime, the druggies, the hell temps, now topping 120 most every summer. Cat calls and whistles, the heat of many eyes affirmed that for one minute between rounds, Blythe was the center of this raucous, beer soured universe. She let each platform heel come down in time with a hip hop loop bumped on the PA, just firm enough to shake her goods without being herky jerky a flaw she'd noticed in other girls from the agency. She raised the card higher, felt a slight pinch from one of her nipple covers. The only action her body had seen in weeks because her man Sandro practiced celibacy before a fight. Inside the cage, he sat taking instruction from Franco, his trainer. On the opposite side, Musaf Ali panted on his stool, coal skinned, Ace goose egged from Sandro's accuracy of hand and foot. I'll stop there. Thanks, EJ. So, um, so tell us a little bit about the the genesis of your story. What, um, how you chose to write it. What it was like writing the first Mar piece. Um, talk a little bit about that. Um, this is this is one of the few stories where there wasn't a specific image or incident or you know idea it it just kind of came from different directions but i think it's an ode to my days in karate before mma you know came to the fore uh back then you know my heroes were chuck norris and uh jackie chan and bruce lee's spirit wasn't very long gone um and uh, kickboxing was the thing, in other words. And so I got to do that a little bit. And I did it. My first fight spar was with a black belt, my instructor. You know, I'm a little orange belt. And he was a golden gloves boxer before that. So, um, so I got in, in with him. And he, uh, I remember, you know, he he probably would have knocked me out if I wouldn't have had headgear on. <laughs> he threw a crescent kick, caught me on this side, then a, then a right hook on this side, then another kick. I can't tell you what it was because by then, you know, but, but to be, feel a man's power like that, there's something about it that um, I, I, it was kind of sacred. It was kind of a, uh, I don't know, rite of passage, obviously. And I was proud, though, that I didn't go down. Um, and, and I kept fighting until that round was up. But I remember the head, Sensi, after that happened, he went, take it easy, Franco, you know, because he was unleashing. Anyway, so, but those things have lived in me all these years. And, and I've loved uh, MMA. And uh, I wanted to, I guess, capture it. And I don't know, the Octagon Girls, they really exist in the UFC. They're called Octagon Girls. And uh, I guess I wanted to come in the side door 
instead of just some fighter being the protagonist. And uh, I used her and um, of course I made her, um, as the LA Times Review just said to out today, uh, she's a woman who wants to know her mind, but doesn't. You know, she doesn't, and this is an abuse story. And as we know, most women end up going back or staying with their man. I, I don't know what the statistics are, but, you know, and that's kind of the case here, but not quite. Did, so, um, so did, um, did these characters have uh, sort of a bit of, you know, what you experienced through, you know, your background in karate or was it just sort of like that was just like the flavor that you wanted to bring into the story yeah yeah i just story. used i used that as uh as a tone feelings to work off of but sandro who's the mmm fighter um right. his trainer's name franco and that's who that black belt uh trainer was for me um and he was uh mexican franco osuna um and so sandro was brazilian because that's that's really the heart of uh, Grazi uh, Jiu Jitsu is what brought MMA into the fore. Um, and then Octagon Girl, I don't know where she came from. She just is kind of a amalgam of women I know who who don't know their mind, I guess. And I know men like that too. So yeah, they're an amalgamation. Okay, great. Um, we'll come back to your story, but I'm going to move on next to, to Rob Bowman. Before we do, I want to mention, if you have any questions and want to put them in the chat, um, Barbara and I will try to keep uh, track of that. And then if we have some time at the end, we're going to go for close to an hour and we'll leave a little bit of time for questions. So feel free to put them in the chat. So um, Rob Bowman uh, moved to the desert several years ago from Denver his longtime home and setting for his upcoming detective novel. His fiction has appeared in the Coachella Review and the Donnybrook Writing Academy. Additional credits include Modern in Denver, uh, Book and Film Globe, and others. He co-hosts the film and popular pop culture podcast, Real Disagreement. And when not immersed in these things, he is with his wife, Mindy, and their sons, Jetson and Rocket. And um, Rob is here today from India, and I'm going to let you read your piece, and then we'll talk. Sure, yeah. Here's the first, uh, first page of Everything Drains and Disappears. Do you have a better plan? I didn't. Then this is the plan, Monique said. We were broke, sitting at the counter in our apartment, a tilting slab that the ad had fed was a breakfast nook, but was really shellacked and cracked plywood that managed the gloomy trick of always being damp. Always, 115 degrees outside, AC broken, water shut off for not paying the bill. But everything in that place still clammy and sticky, damp without cooling or quenching, like a board made of swamp. Meanwhile, you drive up and down through the desert and every gated community here sucks down electricity, whirls their AC turbines as the windmills churn just next to the mountains, the wind slamming down the slopes and crushing along the fans, chopping down the birds. Not that I care. I wonder about coyotes running along there, eating the obliterated birds. Fly through this valley and get knocked down and eaten. Ever seen the entrances to those neighborhoods? Waterfalls of the clearest water you've ever seen, crashing and slamming down or tripping down little stone steps or shooting straight up and burbling down. Endless gallons of it in the desert in front of the homes of men who haven't gotten it up without prescriptions in decades. Those entrances, those gates, guard booths and cameras, spiked walls, sign-in sheets, parking passes. I didn't have a better plan. All right. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Um, so Rob's story, as he said, was titled Everything Drains and Disappears and it's set in Bermuda Dunes. So yeah. I want to ask you about the choice of uh, Bermuda Dunes for your story. And I didn't know much sure. about that area until I read this and some other folks told me about it. So talk a little bit about why Bermuda Dunes and what that was like um, setting the story sure. there, this strange little place. Yeah, I'm glad to make them known through my slanderous writing. Um, <laughs> so it's... Um, it's, it's more than a neighborhood, but less than a town. 
it's an unincorporated area um, between La Quinta, Palm Desert, and Indio that um, kind of exists in its own logic. And inside of Bermuda Dunes, while it's a gated community, there are multiple gated communities inside of it. So there's neighborhoods inside of this neighborhood of varying um, degrees of wealth. So there's uh, relatively modest apartments and there's multi-million dollar homes in the same gated community that has its own kind of a, I don't know, like fiefdom is really what it seems like. There's, there's tiers of membership to be there and live there and, and it's an odd place. And I happen to live directly across the street from it. So uh, my wife and I on our you know, weekend walks would walk through there and just remark at how unbelievably strange it feels there and vaguely ominous. So it seemed when uh, Barbara uh, was kind enough to invite me into this, there were a couple areas left and I, I suggested Bermuda do. I was like, this, there's this weird thing. Maybe you'd be interested in, which luckily she was. Yeah, I th there's a quote you have um, referring to Bermuda Dunes. You say, there's something wrong with this place. It's not a real town. It's not a real anything. It's an yeah. incorporated island in the middle of the valley without any roads that go through. And then you talk a little bit about um, they have sort of their own security force, but there's not really a police force. And I think that comes into play in your story and how that, you know, could be sort of advantageous and disadvantageous. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, a, it's a theme I noticed actually in a couple stories. Uh, Eduardo, when he talks, the, the, the Riverside sheriffs uh, patrol a lot of unincorporated areas in the valley that don't have their own police forces. But the Riverside sheriffs don't particularly seem concerned with a lot of what goes on. So, it, it, as a result, these wealthier areas do have private security, but the private securities, you know, I, I don't think there's, I, I don't think it's the most stringent of uh, processes to, to join their team necessarily. So it's a, uh, it just feels a little off, feels a little dicey. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about your story. I want to ask you about some of the characters, um, sure. but we'll move on a little bit just so everybody get a chance to read before we go a little further. Um, but thank you, Rob. And um, next up is Eduardo Santiago. Uh, his first novel, Tomorrow They Will Kiss, was an Edmund White Debut Fiction Award finalist. His next book was Midnight uh, Roomba, and it won the New England Book Award for Best Fiction. Eduardo's short stories have appeared in Ziziba, Slow Trains, and The Caribbean Writer. His nonfiction was featured in the Los Angeles Times, The Advocate, and Out Traveler magazine. And he also served on the faculty at Idlewild Arts Academy, uh, which sits way up above Palm Springs. So welcome, Eduardo. We're going to have you read from The Ankle of Anza, set in Anza. OK. Hi, Corey. Hi, everybody. Um, so this is The Ankle of Anza. Um, <clears throat> it took a while for the concerned neighbors to settle down. After the scraping of metal chairs and the worn linoleum, and the greetings of neighbors who rarely saw each other, an expectant silence swept the room. This was Anza, a small community as far as population, but huge in terms of land. Most of it worthless mountaintop, high desert, they called it, sand and scrub and too much damn gravity. But those of us who live here wouldn't trade it for anything. It's peaceful and quiet, save for the occasional meth lab explosion. And God-fearing country, for sure. I turn to face them, each of their dirt-worn faces. There's a look to us here, beady eyes from squinting against sand and wind, white, weathered skin, thinning hair, even the women, whose long gray strands clog sinks all over Anza Valley. The last time we gathered, Jim Ballure's cousin had come to propose solar farms. There was an expectation of wealth, as if everyone had an oil well in the backyard just ripe for the picking. But the more the proposal got into crystalline versus thin film versus photovoltaic, in words like extrapolation, the audience began to glaze over. Even if they all pool their money and their land together, as Gordon Lure suggested, he was talking a million dollar investment before profits. No one here was worth a thousand, let alone a million. No one here was willing to risk the rewards. Coming up on five years ago, that was, 
there are solar farms here now, but none of the people present were making the money. No one knew um, those who were profiting, silent partners and all that. But these people whose eyes were on me now, I knew them chapter and verse. I want to give you people a heads up, I said. We have a cat burglar up in here. There's no denying it any longer. There were many, what? And what do you say? And speak up. That is what's called an aging community. Too many of us on the slightest slope of 80. We became hard of hearing from wearing old ears and having no one to listen to anymore, save for the TV, which can be burnt, which, which can be turned up or down depending on mood or need. I repeated myself with a bit more vocal power. What's with the cat shit, Dave? Ain't she just a plain old fucking burglar, as Don Donner, who had never uttered a sentence without a fuck or a shit in it? I said, she has the nasty habit of sneaking into your home when no one's there, locking up when she leaves, opens up your vehicles, takes a few things, locks it all up when she leaves. She's meticulous, leaves the place like you left it. You just think you've misplaced things, but she took them will slip into an unlocked door, take your things while you're asleep. She has taken important things from several people that I know, including, but not limited to car titles, the keys to your PO box, birth certificates and death certificates, property documents, phones, tablets, laptops, knives, flashlights, food stuff, and deodorant, prescription glasses, wallets, whatever she can carry, never breaks nothing. Not a window, not a lock. She's stealth. That don't make her no fucking cat, Donner said. <laughs> Thank you, Eduardo. So, um, Eduardo, <laughs> so Eduardo's <laughs> greeting us today from Pasadena, but was a longtime resident of Idlewild. And um, so I'm wondering, um, it seems like you know that area pretty well. I sort of see Anza as kind of like on the periphery. And what I love is not only is your story so descriptive about the area, but really about all these characters and these sort of like small town, you know, types that you see in these little offbeat places. So I wanted to ask you about writing that story and sort of how you knew the flavor of the area or what, if you had to do research or was that just something you were sort of aware of already? Mm, so, um, my friend, uh, Sarah lives in Anza, Sarah Marchant, she's out there somewhere. Um, so I got to go to, um, to Anza quite a bit and, um, and you had to drive through it to get to Temecula where my brother lives. And it always just seemed like a mysterious place to me. And, um, every once in a while, somebody would come into Idlewild and say, oh my God, um, there's like 12 helicopters flying over Anza, you know, police helicopters and what's going on over there, you know? So um, Anza was always a place of curiosity. So when Barbara uh, approached me, um, I said, I, um, I don't live in Palm Springs. So I don't know if I should write for Palm Springs Noir, but there is this thing called the uh, um, Palms to Pines Highway, which takes you from the desert to the high desert um and it takes you to Anza so I could write about Anza and she said okay um and so then I started to do you know more research and the truth is that on Anza's crime watch <laughs> uh which is a Facebook page you guys should take a look there actually was a cat burglar and like who even who even thinks of cat burglars anymore right um, but I just love the idea that Anza had a cat burglar and that the community was up in arms about it. Um, so, so then I had to make her up. <laughs> you know, cat burglars sound so sweet always. I don't know, you know. I know, I they're kidding. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, well, that's great. Well, well, we'll get back to your story a little bit more, but I think this sure. is a great segue to Kelly, who's greeting us from Temecula. Right. And, <laughs> but whose story um, uh, that she's gonna read from in Seven Cathedral City. But I'm gonna introduce Kelly first, and then um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, her contribution to Palm Springs Noir. Um, Kelly Shire has published work in numerous journals, including Brevity, Entropy, and the Coachella Review. Her essay, Beautiful Music, about 
longstanding Cathedral City radio station KWXY appear in Full Grown People. As a half Mexican American, third generation resident of Southern California, her writing often explores themes of place and identity. She lives in Palm Springs with her children and husband and is completing a memoir. memoir. Um, and before we talk with Kelly a little bit, she's going to read from A Cold Girl, which is set in Cathedral City. Okay, thank you. At 17, Jesse knew a few things. Like if you knew a guy and pictured a sweaty scene of the two of you tangled in the dark, chances were good that he'd already beat you to it. He probably imagined his own version in an X-rated detail, back when you were stalled out and how good his forearms looked in his white dress shirt with his rolled up sleeves. Nick, for example. Though he was her cousin Mia's boyfriend, she caught him looking at her since she arrived two weeks ago. She thought about him plenty. It was hard not to, with them all living under the same roof in Mia's tiny apartment. She tried not to stare when he came out of the shower after work, a towel wrapped around his waist to walk from the bathroom to the bedroom he shared with Mia. So she didn't feel guilty lying in her sofa bed at night and conjuring up scenarios with Nick, scenes of kissing and rubbing against each other, her hands braced on his golden arms. In her visions, the room was always dark except for a row of white candles in the background and she was dressed in something filmy and flowing, something that made her look like Stevie Nicks as she wafted into the room. And it was always late, very late at night. Compared to Palm Springs, the town that was its immediate neighbor to the West, Cathedral City was a poor relation, an awkward middle child, the last kid picked for the team. This was also how Jessie had always felt whenever she stood beside or thought about her older cousin, Mia. Mia and her family lived in Cathedral City, but to Jessie, her cousin had always seemed like Palm Springs, more popular, prettier, and desirable. Mm -hmm. Jessie wasn't exactly poor, but she'd grown up in a small bungalow up in Santa Clara. Though her parents' house in the Pricey Bear area was worth more money, Jessie didn't understand all that. All she knew was that Mia's parents, her aunt and uncle, owned a sprawling Spanish-style house in the south end of Cathedral, Cathedral City, up in the hills in a neighborhood called The Cove. Jessie had grown up having to swim in her town's public community pool. Mia had grown up with her own shimmery turquoise pool with a hot tub right outside her patio door. Jessie was staying with her cousin for six summer weeks in Mia's crammed apartment in Cat City, as she called it. The first time she'd walked in the front door, Jessie had been shocked at the size and overall rundown state of place. Mia's dingy apartment sat a few blocks north of Dinosaur Drive, one of those long desert streets named for celebrities nobody younger than 100 could remember. It, it had only one bedroom and thin kitchen cabinets painted white that felt sticky to the touch. The floor tiles were white too, but looked gray, and a lot of them were chipped or cracked. For the first time in her life, Jessie felt like she might be richer and maybe even smarter than her beautiful cousin. Great, thank you. Um, fantastic. Thanks. So um, before I ask you a question, if, if anybody's um, not muted who's watching, if you could mute, leave a little clicking sound. It could be coming from somebody, I'm not sure. Um, so Kelly, um, Cathedral City, it felt to me like you know Cathedral City pretty well, or if you didn't, you did some research and you, um, you know, you touch the, the town very well and you mentioned a lot of little places like Taco Bell and strip clubs on Perez and the Cove and things that are in the area. So talk about how Cathedral City happened for you and, you know, what it was like setting your story in that location. So even though I don't live in Palm Springs yet, um, yet, uh, my husband grew up in Cathedral City. And he moved out there when he was pretty young. And eventually his family moved across the 10 up to Morongo, but a lot of his formative years were in Cathedral City. And so we go out there still a lot. And he has shown me uh, sort of the insider's you know, a feel of Cathedral City. So I feel like I know the area pretty well. His grandparents, um, when they were alive, lived in one of the country clubs, uh, one of the mobile home country clubs, golf clubs in the area there. And we ate up a lot of the restaurants. And I mean, being right next to Palm Springs, even when we're just, we are just the tourists in Palm Springs, we, we still go back and visit it a lot. We, we always usually drive by his old house that he grew up in because it's still there. Um, 
he comments a lot on the things that used to be there because it's changed a lot. Um, and my little insider thing about the Taco Bell that used to be the Jack in the Box, that was actually his first job when he was a teenager. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how Cathedral City, um, even though it's, and again, even though it's right next to Palm Springs, and if you don't know the area and you're just driving along 111, it, you know, you don't really feel the, the change right away, I don't think, I'm trying to remember, but, but um, there's definitely a, a different feeling about it. And it's gotten a lot bigger, so there's a lot more suburban, tidy places, but I was more interested in the, the edgier, grittier areas of, of uh, Cathedral City. Yeah, yeah, I'm right on the border, so, and I've been out here a little over a year, so I'm just sort of discovering some of the differences. And I loved, you read it in your piece, but um, that line you said compared to Palm Springs, uh, the, the town that was its immediate neighbor to the West Cathedral City was a poor relation, an awkward middle child, the last kid, kid picked for the team. Yeah. That was great. I thought that said a lot. So yeah, I don't. I don't think that there was ever any like bragging rights, you know, growing up in Cathedral City, you know, necessarily. It was like, you know, oh, you're just from Cathedral City. Yeah. Well, great. We'll we'll talk a little bit about more about your piece, but we're going to go back to Barbara because aside from being the uh, editor, she is one of the contributors to the anthology, and. Um, I've already read uh, Barbara's bio earlier, so I won't read it again, but we're gonna have Barbara read a short piece from her story, which is called The Water Holds You Still, which is set uh, in Palm Springs in the Twin Palms area. Hey, the landline rang after midnight. It had to be my mother down in Palm Springs. She was the reason I kept the line. I picked up, hi mom. There was a noise, she said. I stood my brush in a jar of water. Red paint escaped the bristles, a blood cloud. I took the phone outside, the curly black cord stretched taut as a tightrope. Ferns along the patio were wet with night mist, common here on the central coast. Houses settle at night, make noises, I said. A few months ago, she began calling me about noises at night and the calls were coming more often. A puff of breath and the faint strain of music, Sinatra, mood indigo. She'd become obsessed with him more so since my stepfather, Jerry, died. A coyote was outside by the pool, she said. It was sniffing the water. Maybe it's bored, I said. No little dogs around to eat. Greta, that's not funny. You're keeping Joey Bishop in, right? He was her little red Pomeranian. He's in. Her voice dropped an octave. My sapphire ring is missing. Your brother was here. Every time he stops by, something else goes missing. Are you sure? Out on the highway, red and blue lights whirled by. Last week, it was my diamond earrings. I was going to give those to you. I took it personally. My brother knew they would be mine someday. I've always loved those earrings, I said. Has anyone other than Ben been around? Repair people, pool cleaner, gardener. I can't keep track. So it could be anyone. Do you think your brother's gambling again, she asked. People go to those pawn shops up on Palm Canyon and over in Cathedral City to sell things they steal, or they sell them on clubs list. You mean Craigslist, make fun. Look, mom, I said, if Ben's stealing from you, call the police, turn him in. I can't, she said, he's my son. All right, thank you, Barbara. Um, great. So Barbara, you had mentioned earlier that you had stayed somewhere in Twin Palms and that seemed to be maybe the launch point for this story. Yes. So how did that sort of evolve from you from the house and the pool and then, you know, you created this piece? Well, apparently, I, I just read my story again the other day mm -hmm. and I was kind of astounded how autobiographical it is. I mean, not not the crime, not, not what happens, but just the mother and the son and the daughter dynamic. So much um, came from my family, you know? Um, the little red Pomeranian, We I grew up with a little red Pomeranian. He wasn't named Joey Bishop, but um, so there's just so many elements that, um, found their way in. I, I didn't plan it that way. It just 
happened. I mean, once I had the setting and I knew the pool would figure in, then it was who's in this and what did they do? So the, the, so the Pomeranian is Joey Bishop, your, <laughs> mother, your mother's home, you know, she's playing Frank Sinatra, you know, in the beginning of the story. And at some point there's a reference, she knew him and was at a party, I think. And there's a Marilyn Monroe mug. What I loved in your piece um, is that you sort of throw in these little details about old Hollywood, which has such a strong connection to Palm Springs, still does, especially with certain generation. And I wondered if that was intentional, um, you know, because it's just, it's kind of within the culture here a little bit. I love all those elements about Palm Springs. I mean, I love all of them. And so I wanted to live in that house, in that world. When I got the go ahead to do the, the anthology, I had just rented this house. So my month in Palm Springs was in this house. And um, it didn't have all of the uh, things, all the items that were in the story, but some of them and mm -hmm. in other houses I've rented over the years. So I wanted to be in that, in that world. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to also ask you about the, the pool, which you've referenced. Um, you know, uh, out here, water is such an interesting thing because, you know, there's a drought all over the West Coast. But, you know, particularly, you know, I think we think of drought out here a lot because it's so hot. And there's also all this sort of artificial water in these beautiful areas that's, you know, that are landscaped in ways that they shouldn't be. And so water is just such an interesting element out here. And so many people have pools. And the pool in this story, to me, kind of had a dual thing where there was sort of an eroticism around it. Like there were things that happened around the pool between two of the characters and, you know, pools, especially at night have sort of a mystique, but it was also a source of uh, danger ultimately. Um, so I don't know if you could expand a little bit more about that, but those were just things, some things that I noticed around that. Well, without giving anything away, I did do research for the story and, and that element of research had to do with swimming pools because they, they always seem a bit, I'm suspect, you know, because there's electricity, there are lights connected to wires, connected to somewhere else and there's all this water. And so we're so trusting when we jump in a swimming pool, you know, but things happen and, um, yeah, <laughs> okay. that's probably all I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and the pool also, um, because there are characters that, that, that have done well, probably, or well enough having this house. And then the pool has the, the pool guy who maybe isn't as well off. And in a number of the stories, um, there is some differentiation between the haves and have nots. I noticed a number of people in the book wrote sort of characters that were sort of on the edges or maybe not doing as well versus people who have. So um, maybe I'll ask you about that, Barbara, first, then I wanna ask a couple other folks about that who I feel like incorporated that in their piece. Well, there's this whole, um, I, I mean, Todd Goldberg can, can speak to this and does speak to this, how you know the, the community of people who work out there have a certain view of the people who come there and so, I mean, I think the, the, the pool maintenance guys and women, the, the gardeners, all of those people know so much about what's going on in Palm Springs mm -hmm. and um, have such access, you know? Although I think in my story, it's not clear who, does, who did what by the end of it, you know, who actually committed. Well, I can't say more. But anyway, I, I think it's just they have such access and, you know, if they could, if they, if they wrote, maybe they do write about people that come into the city, into the area, into the valley and, and what happens and what they observe. I, I think it would be fascinating, actually. All right. Well, we won't give away any spoilers. I think by virtue of these being noir stories, we can be rest assured that there will be <laughs> death and dead bodies and, you know, a little bit of destruction and, you know, difficult things happening. Um, uh, Rob, your story as well, you know, there was a pretty big division, of, you know, of this pretty wealthy family in uh, Bermuda Dunes and the other characters who are 
living in Cathedral City. <laughs> and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, sure. Yeah. Mine. Uh, yeah. It's um. Well, I, I teach high school here in the desert, and I uh, de deliberately have chosen to teach in in schools that have um more more working class populations to them. It's a community I work well with. And I feel a calling to work with. I I enjoy it very much. And in here in this community, it's when you talk to people who live here, um, you know, wh whenever there's a resort of whatever kind, the support staff have to live nearby. You know, whether it's Hawaii or whatever else, the people who serve have to live there. And they are always living in lesser conditions than the guests, but have to pretend to like the guests. You know, there's a there's an invasive quality to all of it. And so that animosity, and you know, we've experienced it, you know, individually on a smaller scale, if you've ever waited tables, you know, like they're, they're not, you pretend the guest is your friend, even though you do not necessarily or at all like them. Um, so, you know, and there's, I think, very much a feeling now of when am I going to take back what's mine? How, how can I take back from them? And what, what am I going to get? And a lot of my story is there's a, at the very beginning of my story, there's a kind of bent old woman who kind of ominously says, go and get what you want. It doesn't matter what anyone else does, get what you want. And uh, says that to the female protagonist, Monique. And I think that's a really kind of uh, important notion, not, not that it's an admirable one necessarily, but that people are desperate to get what is theirs when things are so unfair. I mean, this morning, the, the Richard Branson taking off into space thing, I find so incredibly repulsive. And it's, how can I not find it repulsive? I'm a public school teacher. It's, it's grotesque what he's doing. You know, not woe is me, teachers are, we do fine. But there's a, that there's such a huge disparity. And here in the desert, it's really marked in that if you go, you know, what you, you can cross the street from a very dangerous neighborhood into an extraordinarily wealthy one. And it's a, it, it's a really stark contrast here in the desert. You, your, your story, as well as a number of the others, you know, you, you kind of know early on, Monique and the boyfriend, you know that they're, you know, that they're, you know, a bit of scammers and they're trying to take advantage of people and that there's, you know, maybe blackmail is going to happen or whatever. Um, did you... Did you have that in mind right away when you wrote the story? Did you, were you thinking that in the very beginning when you first started to write it? Uh, I had a couple things. I, I, I first was trying to think of what was a crime, what was a scam that one could reasonably do in this day and age mm -hmm. without, because I think with, when people write crimes, they either ignore what technology exists in the world because it's hard to work around cell phones or they go into futuristic, unrealistic technology or they're all computer hackers somehow. So. I wanted to have like, what's a scam with modern technology that not very smart, resourceful people could pull off? Mm -hmm. And that was really more where I was going with it. Okay, how would I do this? And, you know, my characters are people who are left in the lurch of the legalization of marijuana because they're, they're small time pot dealers who can't afford to open a really posh Starbucks-esque pot shop. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? Like, what's, what is there for them? So they turn to this kind of small time scam that gets out of control. Yeah. And, um, and Kelly, in your story, um, Jesse, who's a 17 year old young woman, you know, to me kind of starts out, you know, she's probably a little naive. She's visiting her cousin, staying for a while in Cathedral City, right. and not quite sure what she's about. And then she's sort of, you know, she's a lot more clever than you realize over time. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Jessie. She was a really interesting character. She wasn't quite a woman yet, but she, she kind of was, you know, you realize right. she's a lot more going on than you realize. I, I think of Jessie as being extraordinarily naive. Um, she, she wants to, um, but on the other hand, she sort of has like that, that very limited morality of teenagers, you know, where like the right and wrong and, and being in the room with, uh, the apartment, this tiny apartment with her cousin and the cousin's boyfriend that she's obviously thinking about. Like her her ethics and morality just don't really seem to come into play because I think it's part of her teenage life that nothing really matters. Nothing really has consequence. So so yeah. And as far as like again the, the money thing, you know, her she doesn't really understand that by virtue of living in the Bay Area, even though she's lived in a tiny house, there's 
maybe more money in her family than, than the big sprawling house in Cathedral City, just because you know, that's how California real estate works and, and kids don't get that. So yeah, she's, she, uh, she wants what she wants and she's going to take what she takes. And, um, you know, she, she, uh, she doesn't come out smelling too good. I don't think at the end, um, not to give anything away, but because she is sort of driven by her boredom and her and her lust, and again, just this extraordinary naivete of not understanding um, money or or any kind of consequences. And again, that comes back to being a teenager, and and money that's given to you is sort of magical and invisible. It doesn't really have any sort of ties to actual laws or mm. you know a, a real source when you're just given money, um, which is kind of what she is. So, so that's, that's Jessie to me. She's, she wants a lot of things and she doesn't really think about who she might hurt or, you know, damage in the process of just getting what she wants or doing what she wants. Interestingly though, I found, you know, she was more clever at the end than I thought she was. Right. Not that I agreed on right. her decisions. But yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And Eduardo, in your um, story, um, Kimberly, such an interesting protagonist antagonist you know sort of in between you know uh, somebody in and out of recovery an addict um who finds her way to anza um, to do what she does talk a little bit more if you can without revealing anything about kimberly because she was really interesting character to me well um one sunday in idlewild i ran in I met this woman and, and she was very, uh, really beautiful, kind of like a Heather Locklear kind of, you know, expensive looking woman. And we got to talking and uh, she told me that she was recovering at Betty Ford, but that they would give her the weekends off to spend with her husband and her kids. And that they would come up to, to Idlewild where it was cooler. And I said, wow, that, that, that's, you know, and then she told me the reason that she was, um, uh, that, that she went to rehab. And, um, and I said, wow, that sounds really interesting. I'm a writer, you mind if I write about you? And, uh, and this is long before Barbara approached me. And, uh, and she said, uh, it's fine as long as you don't use my name. So I kind of put that in the back of my mind. And, uh, and uh, when I needed an identity, for the cat burglar, um, I thought of her. I mean, what if you are at Betty Ford and you escape and go on the lamb, which I like to call on the lamb, um, and, um, and, uh, and, and have your adventures in Anza, right? Which is kind of endlessly fascinating to me anyway. Um, so I just kind of merged those two elements and, uh, and the psychology of Kimberly is that she, um, you know, comes from a, uh, I don't know, um, low rent, um, um, the desert family, her and her mother. And I think the most telling line is that her mother says, I don't know why, um, you're wasting your time serving up tacos in a restaurant when you're certainly pretty enough to be a stripper. Um, and um, what what Kimberly does is that she sells herself to, to a guy who's going to take care of her, uh, but her conscience makes her crazy. So she has to take a lot of drugs and alcohol to live with herself and, and it, it gets out of hand. Um, She's a but, you know, this is not none of this is in the book. <laughs> yeah. So I've given nothing away. Right, um, right, right. And she's a bit of a. I, saw her a bit I of just a, found it. I just. I don't know. You know. Right. She's a bit of a drifter. It seemed like to me too. She, she becomes she, a drifter. Yeah. She. She. She's not she just becomes, an Anza. She's originally, I think, an Indio. Yeah. Uh, Sarah just. Sarah just piped in with Anza is not that fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I've never been. I'm going to have to go visit. Um, yeah. We're going to go to right around six. Boy, this goes so fast, right? Um, if there's any questions and people want to put them in the chat, feel free to do so. Um, I want to get back to CJ for a minute, too. Um, so the, a lot of these stories, and we were touching on this 
before we even started. There's a lot of um, sort of female lead characters. Um, and in, in your piece, we have um, Blythe, who's the uh, an octagon uh, girl. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about the octagon girls, who's with this uh, uh, MWA fighter and in an abusive relationship. So talk a little bit about Blythe to us and how she came about and how that developed. Oh, you're on, uh, you're on uh, mute. Oh, let's ask you to unmute. No, we still have you on mute. How about now? Oh yeah, you're good now. I don't know how it happened. I didn't, I didn't touch a thing. Right. Anyway, um, uh, Blythe. Oh, you're a little echoey. Yeah, I, he I hear that too. And now you're okay. How about now? Okay, I was leaning in too close. Um, Blythe, I, I don't know. I just know I, I've known some women. Um, you know, there's a retro row here in Toledo and there are strip clubs, adult bookstores, there's a massage parlor. There was an s and house. I, I don't know what went on there. I just, <laughs> you'd see it going by. So anyway, um, and it's like, why, why do women on their side of it wanna get, wanna get involved in that? Why do they wanna go deep into that world? You know, what puts them there and, um, yeah, they're young. There's a little immaturity, but Blythe is 29. I wanted her to know a little bit more about herself than a young girl. And she auditions to be an octagon girl. Um, she isn't one yet, by the way, in my story. That is her aspiration. She's just working these uh, seedier places. The sports arena, though, is new, and that's big to her. That's her best gig. So she starts seeing um, shiny things. Uh, wants more. It wasn't like that was her original intent. Um, and Sandro, his record is 15-0 uh, and 0 in the story. And if he wins one more fight, the one he wins in the opening, he's going to be sponsored and uh, by an MMA uh, like equipment company and get some money, a lot of money coming in. And they want to move to LA. He wants to take her to LA, live big, live larger. So she slowly starts wanting more and more. And while trying to be a mother with her son from a previous liaison, um, and those things start to conflict, you know. So I wanted more going on than just, you know, a young girl that just wants to get involved and she wants attention, you know. That, that's what I've seen with, you know, they just want attention, it's all about me. So anyway. Um, she started to, to just come together that way of her own uh, as I followed her. Yeah, there's, it's a little bit almost like they're, you know, they have that Hollywood dream, but it's not like the typical that they're desiring to go there to be in the movies and act. It's sort of in this other setting and that, um, and the octagon girl, you know, that yeah, it, she's not desiring it, to be, you know, a starlet or, you know, something like that. Yeah, you don't, you think it's all the, the normal, I want to be an actress or I want to be, but there are people that aspire to these, these little microcosms, you know, these, they're, they're, uh, they're almost, uh, they're underworlds, they're a little cultish and, uh, you know, she's looking forward to a better locker room to change in better conditions. Yeah. And uh, I remember to go into fights that were in a bar, you know, they clear out a room and they set up a ring. And, and this was, you know, between a guy that was rated high in the uh, kickboxing circuit and my own instructor, and it was an exhibition fight. Uh, another one was in a VA hall, you know, when the floor of the ring broke down in the middle of the fight, you know, it's a CD world. And then there were some nice venues and that was always, oh yeah. So anyway, it was, it, it's, I guess I wanted to go into that world and use Blythe as my, uh, you know, it's my focal point. Well, she was a great character and you were, you know, great characters in all the stories. Um, so I, I didn't see any questions here, but I wanna, um, before we close out, I wanna ask everybody, 
about um, you know your thoughts about writing noir in general, and is this something you think you might do again? And also just what's um, next on the agenda for everyone. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the other stuff with the book afterwards. So um, maybe I'll start with Barbara. Well, I love noir. Um, I, I love how it's changing too, how, how a lot of the noir tropes don't necessarily have to be included in noir stories. It's really a vibe. It's more a vibe than anything else, maybe. I mean, all the tropes are great and, and, and good, but, um, I, but I love it. And um, I was just watching Vertigo before I came here. Just, I've seen it many times, but just had to, had to watch it again. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm, I, since, I think since Orange County Noir, since that story, I've written a number of stories that are darkish. And until that story, I didn't know how much I loved it. It's just, you know, it's something about these characters who um, try to do well and they just keep missing it. I find that really interesting. You know, I mean, there's a part of, I mean, all of us do that to some extent. We just, you know, keep trying to do better and, you know, we, we don't always, right? And so, um, yeah, so I, I'm continuing. I love it. And um, yeah. So somebody did just ask, thank you, Barbara, if any of these stories are previews for novels. So as I go around to other folks, um, maybe you can answer that question if that applies to you. Should they be? <laughs> What's that? I said, should they be? <laughs> To know. Um, so Eduardo, how about you? Uh, either answer that question or just talk a little bit about writing noir and what that might mean for you for the future. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, and also if you have any interesting projects coming up you want to see. So um, Barbara, um, you're to blame for this, but I, I just want to write noir all the time now. <laughs> I just really, really enjoyed the process and the results. And um, I, you know, it's just great, uh, great fun to write this stuff. Um, I particularly want to write um, about the desert more. Um, and uh, there's a uh, bar, uh, I think it's near Indio on 111 called The Nest. And that's where desert women go to meet wealthy old men. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, my next novel is called Eduardo's Nest. Um, so, um, so I'm excited about that. Um, I, think, I think this could become definitely uh, a novel for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that I can follow Kimberly around for another um, 300 pages. <laughs> That's ambitious. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoy this pro uh, this new genre, which I almost said no to Barbara. I said, I, I'm not a noir writer, but I but do I'm love it. I'm glad you said yes. Is there anything else on your plate that you want everybody to know about and you're working on? Well, you know, I just finished the, the third book in my Cuban trilogy and actually writing this story was really great because there's no Cubans in it. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, I only lived in Cuba for 10 years and then I lived in the United States for 54 and yet I'm the Cuban writer, you know, um, although I must point out, I was not asked to contribute to, um, to Havana Noir. So I'm a little pissed off about that, but not, not to a murderous point. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're low, you're low noir in that level. Yes. <laughs> it's a low noir. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm glad to be part of Palm Springs Noir. I've been going to Palm Springs since I was 14 years old. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a Tom big Goldberg, party. who's a contributor to this um, publication wrote, I'm afraid there are no more spots available to write Desert Noir. Well, we'll have to see about that, Todd. Oh um, my God, there are so <laughs> many. There are so many. Um, uh, Slab City, like yeah. I said before, Slab City is yeah. definitely. And also, you know, I was thinking we, we didn't do anything with Modernism Week. We didn't do anything with the film festival, the Noir Film Festival. I mean, there's all these events that happen in Palm Springs that are just perfect settings, right, for stories and novels. Yeah, the short film festival. 
Yeah. Um, Rob, how about you? Thoughts? What's up for you in the future? Novel? Yeah. Um, I certainly, um, Todd is a friend and a mentor, and uh, Mark Haskell Smith is a mentor of mine, and they're both crime writers, certainly. I don't think I would categorize either as a, as a noir writer. Um, and I'm working on a crime novel now that I'm really enjoying. And I, there's, you know, when you get on literary Twitter, there's big arguments of what is genre and what is literary now. Mm -hmm. And crime really coming forward is, I think, really the, the prominent literary genre in a funny way, because it's people at their most extreme. Uh, and I enjoy writing not noir, but it's such an inherently cynical mode that I, I think crime has more room for optimism and I'm a pretty optimistic person. So I think I find myself more drawn to that than noir. That said, I'd happily write more noir for any collection or anything else. I do enjoy it very much, but living in that as a novelist, I think would be a, a difficult thing to do. Um, that, that seems like a hard kind of burden to carry generally. But yeah, my uh, detective novel coming up, I'm, I'm very excited about it it's, uh, in its, final stages right now and hopefully be sent out to people soon. Great. Yeah, it's, I was thinking, you know, it's interesting when you're sort of defining these things and sometimes, you know, stuff doesn't fall neatly into one category. I mean, I was yeah. working on a sci-fi short story um, event and we had all these conversations about sci-fi versus fantasy versus speculative fiction. So, you know, when you get into crime, mystery, thriller, detective, noir, I mean, it's so interesting. The, conversations. Yeah, all these subcategories. And, you know, Barbara, when she first invited me into this, Barbara, to her credit, she didn't know who I was at all. It was a recommendation. And she said, you know, I don't, I don't know who you are. And as her kind of like limits test for me, she said, well, define noir for me. And we were talking about how every choice someone makes is the wrong one and leads to bad things. <laughs> you know, and that's, a, that's a really curious thing that leaves little room for redemption for characters. Ultimately, there's, I'm sure there are redemptive noir stories, but I can't think of any. And that's a it's a curious place to spend your time. It's tough. Yeah. How about you, CJ? I am sort of in Rob's camp. Um, I I wouldn't be able to stay with noir all the time. It's uh, it's morose, man. Um, but uh, I I did love doing it, and uh, I think one of the reasons is I live sort of in a noir area and it's too much around me to write about it. I have to write something after I have distance from it. Um, and I'm, I'm writing um, a hybrid book right now about living uh, in Costa Mesa on a bluff uh, that, that uh, was about hundred feet up and, and these hawks would float by our window you know, the one, the one uh, west wall, it was all glass. This woman before who had it before redid it. So it's about living with these hawks, but about the conflict of human density and all these other things. Um, so what I'm trying to say is nature has really uh, one of my foremost um, draws. And then I'm getting into uh, soft sci-fi with my short fiction. And a little bit of genre mashing, horror, soft sci-fi. Um, and that's happening a lot now, I think. Genre mashing is really becoming, you know, matter of fact. So. Um, we have another question, but I'm gonna go, go, to, go to Kelly first and then if we can hang out here a little bit longer. We'll get to the other question. I wanna mention quickly, just in case folks have to log off, that we're going to have some additional um, events, uh, some that I'll be one I'll be part of, and others that will be Barbara and some other authors from the book. And if you go to Barbara's um, website or the Akashic website, you can find out more. And I'll and maybe Barbara, you can type those in there. So um, there's going to be some other really cool panels and things coming up. Um, anyway, I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad for those of you who didn't know Barbara that you were included, um, and it's wonderful to have you here. Um, so Kelly. How about you? Um, what's the future look like for you? Do you have any other projects coming up? Do um, you think you'll write more, more noir? Oh, we got you on the... I don't know if I'll write noir. Um, I mean, if asked to do another anthology or to do another short, short story uh, kind of contribution, I'd love to do it. Like I said before, um, I think in private with you guys that I used to solely write short fiction and short stories, but I haven't been doing that in a while. So it was it was fun 
to, to get back into fiction and to have these characters and to put them in these situations. And um, I, would, I would love to do something more with, with crime or even some kind of thriller or even a little bit of horror, which is, I know it's a totally different genre, but um, I, I like that darkness, but also to add a little bit of campiness or a little bit of humor, because I think that can definitely lighten things up. Um, and as far as me, I am working on a memoir and I'm about halfway done. And the part of the part of me that was maybe in uh, a cold girl in the noir book that's also in the memoir is um, it's very music oriented and Jesse is very you know she mentions the Stevie Nicks and she, the, the the title is based on a door song and so my memoir is um, it's a pretty it's a memoir and essays and each essay deals with different songs from mostly the 70s and 80s um, mm -hmm. through a, through a lens of, of pop culture and songs so that, that's my connection to to the the me in the story and I'm just I'm just working on finishing it and uh, you know hopefully hopefully get a few essays from that back out in the world I haven't published any of those recently but just just working and finishing the not the, the memoir great great um so I'm gonna ask Sean's question in just a second. You know, I, you know, I think it's interesting about the sort of dark elements of noir because sometimes um, I find the twistier the story is and the darker, that there's almost sort of humor underlying it, especially if it's so twisted. So sometimes I think there's unexpected humor in noir when we think of it as being so dark. Um, did somebody wanna? Um, I'm going to ask Sean's question, which is interesting. Did any of you think in black and white while writing these stories? Did any of these stories live in black and white in your head while they were being created? Hmm. Then question, and maybe just generally, like visually, how did you see your story? Anybody answer, answer is already black and white. <laughs> it, that, that's, that's how it exists. Um, so, but I mean, I think it's... I don't know about you guys, but I think it's impossible to ignore the colors of Palm Springs and the desert, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, now, now that the question has been brought up, I, I read it earlier, I'm trying to picture, you know, what, what Palm Springs and the desert area would look like in black and white. And it, it's not a good look. <laughs> well, it's so colorful, you yeah. know, it's a colorful place. You know, the, the architecture, the, the blue of the swimming pools, the sky, the sun, yes. the sunrises, it's just, it's really a gorgeous place. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, trying to picture it in black and white. I mean, certainly photos of it in black and white, but I didn't, I never thought black and white with, with my story. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, because I mean, I, when I think of noir, I usually think of LA or New York, which are very cities that lend themselves black and white very mm -hmm. easily, the kind of stark lines and all the rest. But when I, I remember very distinctly when we moved to the desert, being struck that there were bougainvillea petals in the gutters, that the gutters are full of pink flower petals has, mm -hmm. has always destroyed my brain. That's such a colorful place. Even the, even the gutters are full of flowers. It's a remarkable, colorful thing here. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, you know, Barbara, you talked about this a little bit in the introduction to the book. You know, it's so, you know, bright after the light is so bright, but, you know, there's also literal, you know, a lot of darkness. And uh, like, even near where I live, it's very dark, you know, and sometimes at night, I feel like it feels almost more literally black and white because mm -hmm. some areas are so dark, you know, yes. punctured with just a little bit of light here and there. Um, anybody else on that or just sort of visualizing your story? And, I was going to say the sun in Palm Springs, uh, you know, you've heard of the golden hour when Hollywood would most shoot scenes because there's this beautiful light. But in Palm Springs, it's like the golden hour all day long, <laughs> not just that latter time in the evening. It really is. Barb talked a little bit about it in the beginning. And Barb would po will post these photos when she's in Palm Springs on Instagram that show that light. She always captures it. And, you know, I, I don't think you doctor them much, do you, or shop them much? Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. It's the way it is. So, yeah. Yeah, I think Palm Springs is the one place in the whole noir Akashic series where you have to think in color or in, in beautiful gold, at least. Mm -hmm. 
Catherine Kramer mentioned Black Widow. Catherine, are you talking about the one with, um, oh. Um, Deborah, Deborah Winger. And Deborah Winger and Russell. Russell. And somebody. Teresa Russell. Yeah. Teresa Russell. Yeah. Yes. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a cult out there. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Well, if I haven't sent you my essay notes, I'm sure they're very disorganized. But it's a film I love to lecture on. Yeah. I, love I think The Lady from Shanghai uh, was black and white. Uh, and it took place on a yacht and lots of water and all this kind of stuff. And they'd used this really saturated black and white. And it really worked, you know. So I guess it could maybe, maybe if I shift my filter to that, <laughs> um, parts of Palm Springs could totally be seen in black and white. Lady in Shanghai? A lady from Shanghai, yeah, Rita Hayworth. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm writing it down. <laughs> and Rob is like, yes. Yeah, or some <laughs> else, it's terrific. Yeah, it's a great, great, great film noir. Um, yeah, Catherine also put The Last of Sheila, and I agree with that, that was a great film. Yeah, noir. Last of Sheila's in color, though. Yes, yeah. Um, all right, I mean, we, I could, you know, spend an hour with each of you. That's the hard part about a panel, right? You know, we, we, we kind of get little tidbits from everybody. Does anybody have any final thoughts on the panel? Eduardo, you were- I, Yeah, I just wanted to ask the, um, the, the writers a, a quick question about something that I have trouble with, and that is reversals. You know, when your story is going in one direction and then you have a reversal and then it has to reverse again and then it has to reverse again. Um, does, does anybody have any ideas or struggles with that or does it come easily to you? It doesn't come easily to me, but I think um, what would happen and then what would be unexpected? You know, with my story, I really had some trouble with the ending and then the ending came to me and I'm like, okay, yeah. Because mm -hmm. for me, that was sort of a reversal as to what you, ex what I expected. That wasn't the ending until many revisions into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's a great it, question. I'm curious. It is, it is a great question. I actually, you know, there had been time I was going to ask Barbara about that because I felt like, like in a lot of these, there was such a classic, like just twist right at the end which I love, you know, I just think it, you know, it gives you that moment, you know, at the very end. I also like open-ended short stories too, where you're not really sure. It's a little vague as to what happened mm -hmm. or, or who, uh, who, who the, the guy or the woman was who did it. And, um, and I think, you know, noir can do that. And I think that is one aspect of noir I love, whereas, in other genres of crime fiction, you want that closure, you know? You, yeah. you want the crime to be solved. You want the bad guy to go, you, you know? In noir, it's kind of open-ended and it's uh, it's fun to play with. It is, we, we I, before yeah, the audience yeah. came in, we talked a little bit about that with one of the stories, you know, uncertainty about the ending. CJ, were you gonna say something? Yeah, just that, uh, with Blythe and and what I work with in other stories, there are, there are a series of many reversals uh, throughout the story. I really work with that through interiority, and and human beings are all about reversal. You know, Josh Moore, uh, who Barbara's had on, has said, "Grant your character is the grace of complexity." So people contradict themselves all the time. So I think. If you have a really good character, they are going to reverse track. Mm -hmm. And each reversal is perhaps more, there's more at stake with each one. And then at the end, you know, sort of explodes. Yeah. And Bly, you know, was like that classic in a split second, just something changes, mm -hmm. like it shifts. Something yeah, that, I think that happened in this story more than any character I can recall. That was really a lesson for me. I had to really work on that, uh, that reversal or else she'd be flat, you know, because she spent some time alone with her boy. How do we make it interesting? Reversal was the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rob, Kelly, thoughts from you? 
Yeah, I, I have one. It's a, you know, a, with, I mean, the, I'm in the MFA program with UCR Palm Desert, which I need to give a lot of credit to. One of my professors, Mark Haskell Smith, I was talking to him about my book and worried about, oh, this feels obvious. And what am I doing in the scene? And I was feeling, frankly, not smart enough to write what I wanted to write. You know, we read great novels and we're like, well, I'm not, you know, I don't have that brain, how they do it. And Mark very kindly said, well, they didn't have those in their first draft. You know, like you go and you revise and you add in that complexity because you know, when you finish the story, when you finish the book, you know what complexity is needed and you didn't know it at the start. So those reversals, the foreshadows, the key images, you know, the reader will encounter it for the first time and think, oh, this is all masterfully laid out and brilliantly put together when I was, oh shit, I could put it there, you know, and I, then I did. So it's, a, you know, the, the importance of the magic of, of revision as part of craft is really something that I think allows us to put in those reversals and those complexities and those nuances that are missing in the first drafts or certainly missing in my writing. Uh, maybe I'm the only one. No, no, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Callie, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, um, reversals. Well, Jesse was certainly on a certain path and um, she could have ended up one way. And I think the story could have ended up one way, but I didn't want it to be obviously too obvious about what could have happened in that situation, that scenario. So I wanted to, you know, again, again to kind of switch directions and have the the end be a little bit open-ended like Barbara was talking about, um, but also there is gonna be some uh, some consequences, but maybe not the ones that it yeah. looked like the story was leading up to. Yeah, and that's kind of actually fun to like stop and it's like a puzzle where it looks like we're gonna go in one way and how can I make it go another way and write it so that it doesn't seem like mm -hmm. I obviously reached a roadblock and went, uh, how, how are we gonna get to the next part? So that, that part's actually kind of fun. I think revision is fun. It's the first draft that's, that sucks um, and all the magic you know, happens in the revision like Rob was saying. Really helps to also, I, I like to have readers along the way and, and different readers, and they, they all kind of um, offer some, another view. Like, well, what about this? And what about that? I mean, sometimes we get so, I think, stuck in our own head and in our own stories that we can't see it anymore and you, you know, share it. I know, I know writers who won't share anything until it's absolutely finished, but I'm not one of them. I, I find it very helpful to have readers. Um, well, I, man, I could keep going, but I think, uh, what do you think, Barbara? <laughs> I think uh, we're at an hour and 20 minutes. I think, I think yeah. it's time. Okay. Yeah. I think we've abused our readers enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, think so. I think, I think, I think they had a good time. Most of them have stuck with us, which is great. Yeah. Um, we have more events with different combinations of con contributors uh, the rest of the month maybe mm -hmm. in August. So um, yeah, come back. Everybody who's here, thank you for being here and come yeah, back again. Yeah. Yes, thank you all. It was terrific. It's a great anthology. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, uh, uh, get yourself a copy. Thank you, Corey, for thank hosting. You, Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, everybody. Corey. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thank you, Johnny. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh,